Welcome back to uh, NE630, uh, Nuclear Reactor Theory. So um, this lecture today will be just a review of, of some of the topics that we studied during this semester. Uh, I got some uh, uh, questions to start by defining the diffusion equation and uh, setting up the boundary condition and so on. So let's just uh, uh, start. I don't know if I think it would be better if we can. Can you zoom a little bit uh, here, Mike, and, and show me if you can get this one? Can you, yeah. D did you see it, guys, or do you want me to write? Because if I will write on the blackboard, I don't think that the, we will not have enough time to cover lots of stuff. Because you already, already you took notes of everything, so there is no need for me to write it anymore. But <coughs> anyway, you knew that this is the diffusion equation. Um, uh, when we drive it, we have a time-dependent part, and then we have a balance part here. So we have the source term, we have the source from fission, which is new sigma fission phi, and we have the leakage and absorption, which, re which represent the destruction of the neutrons. So you have sigma absorption phi minus divergence of J. Then this equation, we cannot say that this is diffusion uh, the fusion equation is just continuity equation. One, once we will substitute with divergence J equal to negative divergence of D grad phi, in this case we will call it the diffusion equation. Why? Because J can be represented as negative D grad phi, which is a fixed law, and fixed law describe diffusion. So in this case, why we call it diffusion is when we will assume that the current can be represented by a fixed law similar of fixed law diffusion diffusion law. This is why we call it the diffusion equation. And as you see here, diversion J will be equal to diversion, negative divergence of D grad phi. Then if the, uh, if the medium is uniform, what do we mean by a uniform medium? That there is no dependence on the coordinates. When I tell you in the exam that there is a uh, uniform medium, the coordinates are what? Homogeneous. homogeneous. So everywhere is the same. So in this case, because divergence is just the d by d coordinates, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz, whatever. So in this case, you can take d outside, and this will give you negative d divergence of del phi. And the divergence of the del operator or the divergence of the gradient is just the Laplacian operator. So this will give you a negative d nabla square phi. Again, um, you have to remember when solving the diffusion equation that we have what we call interface condition. What does it mean interface condition? Interface condition is the interface that separates two different mediums. So medium one and medium two. Medium one and medium two they might be completely different mediums, like fuel and moderator, for example. So in between those two mediums, there is a separation, a physical separation, which is just the contact between the liquid and the fuel, or the border between the fuel and the biological shield, or the, or the cement, or the uh, reinforced concrete. So this is interface. So usually when you have interface condition, you have to apply the boundary condition for the interface. We knew that we have two components for the currents. If I ask you in the exam, it's a conceptual question. What's the difference between current, again, flux, uh, and uh, let's say uh, uh, beam-like? So the beam is just one velocity. Yes, it's a uniform velocity, particles moving with uniform, uniform velocity, and it is I, the, the beam, the beam is defined as I equal to NV, and it is the total number of neutrons penetrating the unit area in one direction per, se per, se per, se per second. Yes, so there is no directionality in this case. What's the difference between the beam and the flux? Flux is a scalar also like the beam, but the flux is number of, of, of particles penetrating the unit area in all direction, randomly in all direction. Current, it's a vector quantity. So I and phi are scalar quantity while, while current is what? 
a vector quantity. So, and this is why J is equal to negative D grad phi. And the gradient operator is a vector operator. It's not a scalar. The gradient is a vector operator. It has component in X, Y, Z. So, uh, we knew that there is J minus and J plus, and J minus is just what? The current in the negative X direction. If we are talking about direction in, in the X direction, we will divide the problem to two parts. Particle that move in the positive X direction will be called J plus. Particle that move in the negative X direction will be called J minus. So at zero, let's assume that we have this interface at zero. J minus at zero is just one fourth the flux at zero plus one half the diffusion length d, d phi by dx at zero. This is J minus. And J plus is exactly the same for the first component, but the, the opposite sign. So if you cannot remember in the, in the uh, uh, let's say, an exam or whatever, which one is which, just put the opposite. When we put J minus, take the, the, the sign in the middle here between the two terms as positive. When you talk about J positive or J plus, take the sign here in, the, in between the two terms as J minus. Of course, the exam will be open book, open note, open mind, so whatever you want to use. So you will have the opportunity to use whatever you want. Um, so um, we knew from the interface condition here that we have a medium two and a medium one. We knew that J plus the, the current moving in the, in the, let's say, so actually two should be, this should be one here. Okay, one and this should be two. And this is the positive x direction. If we take the positive x direction, the reverse will be true. So what happened is J plus at zero, which is the, the current just before in, 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 in medium number two, just after you pass the, uh, the interface. So the current in the positive x direction, just to you pass the interface, equal to the current in the positive x direction before the interface plus whatever source you are producing in the interface get half of it because the source if you have source in the interface between the two medium half of it will go to the positive x direction and half of it will go to the negative x direction so you just you will say okay i have a continuation because i, I am talking now about current not about the flux because the flux is what is random and it is everywhere. So the flux should be at the interface should be what? Should be the same. Phi two equal to phi one at the interface. Why? Because although you have source, but what happened? The source is contributing half of it this direction and half of it this direction. So you should expect that the flux will not be changing because the flux is the number of particles going everywhere. Yes? But the only thing that will change is what? Is the current. Because if you are moving this way, although the source is emitting this way, I'm not interested on the neutrons that go in the negative x direction. I'm just interested in the neutron that goes in the positive x direction. So the current just before the, the, the interface is, let's say, J plus one in medium one. There is another J plus in the medium two. What's the difference between both? This will be this plus what's produced, half of what's produced from the source, which is going in this direction. The current, it does not care because the current is what? It's this and this and this and this everywhere. So the current will not sense the presence of the source because the source contributes to the flux everywhere. Yes, but for the current, no. The current, I have to say, there is so many neutrons moving this way there's so many neutrons moving this way. Uh, so the current here is equal to the current before the source plus half what the source produces. Okay, guys. So, um, again, we knew what's the source condition. There is also a boundary condition. So we knew that our boundary condition, that if I give you a problem and I tell you that we have extrapolated distance. You knew that the flux at the extrapolated distance is equal to what? 
is equal to zero. And the extrapolated lambda extrapolated is just something like 0.71 lambda transport. You knew this from from the lectures before. Lambda extrapolated equal to 0.71 lambda lambda transport. So the flux at A plus lambda extrapolated equal to what? Equal to zero. Sometimes you will have you will have if we have a system like this, a slab, then we have the center of symmetry, as some of you asked, is at x equal to zero, which is the center of this slab. So if we do not have any if we do not have any sources at the boundary from this side or from this side, and just we have a, a source distribution uniformly distributed inside this medium, we should expect to have a flux distribution which is symmetric around the center. Yes? So what will be your boundary condition here? Your boundary condition will be you will have flux equal to zero at the extrapolated distance and also d phi by dx at x equal to zero should be equal to zero because you have a maximum in this location. Okay guys, so you have to look at the problem. So if you have a problem like this, it's completely different from a problem that you will have your source coming from one direction. If you have the source coming from this direction, you will never have a baking flux in the center like this. You'll have a decaying, maybe a decaying function. So you have to look at what you are solving. If the center of symmetry is in the center and you do not have any sources from the, the, from the borders, so in this case, you should expect a, 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 a symmetric function. It's exactly the same if you, how many of you here are mechanical or study heat transfer? So if you have a uniform heat source inside a cylinder or inside a slab, you should expect a sinusoidal shape for the heat or for the temperature inside the slab. But if you bring, if you bring a wall, a slab, and start heating the wall from one side and cooling it from the other side, you will never have this distribution. You will have something like this. Exponential decay. So it's exactly the same. Diffusion is diffusion, no matter what you are studying. Diffusion of heat, diffusion of neutrons. So pretty much they are similar. So you have to, to put this into consideration. Again, we used, in order to solve the diffusion equation, we used what we said, the isotropic, isotropic uh, scattering. Yes? When we derive the diffusion equation, we have three or four assumptions. One of them is the source should be one, emitting neutrons isotropically. The other one is the flux is a slowly varying function with, with position. And uh, the third one is what? The scattering, the, the absorption. Absorption can be neglected, yes? And we are dominating by, by scattering. Uh, okay, guys? Then we solve the diffusion equation in two different situations. First one, we solve the diffusion equation in a non-multiplying medium. Then we moved on and solved the diffusion equation for a multiplying medium. What's the difference? When you solve the diffusion equation for a non-multiplying medium, you eliminate new sigma fission multiplied by phi. Yes? And we solved this for a steady state. I will, no I will never bring you a uh, transient uh, problem for a, for a non-multiplying medium, for example. So you consider dn by dt equal to what? Zero. And you do not have any what? Any new sigma fission. So maybe you have a source, external source inside the medium. Because if you do not have an external source inside the medium, this is a trivial solution. Yes? You do not have source of neutrons. So what are you solving for? You have to have sol so source of neutrons. Then we said that when we have a source of neutrons, we transform the diffusion equation. This is the diffusion equation. We have d, uh, d2 phi by dx square minus sigma absorption phi equal to zero. Yes, guys, and I, I, will, I will tell you in a while that we have the source is centered at the center, for example, and everywhere is equal to zero, but at the center, we have a line source, or we have a point source, or we have a slab source, or whatever. So you have to look at the, the problem in hand. So the problem that you will be solving will be just uh, nabla square, nabla square phi minus 1 over L, L square multiplied by phi equal to 0, for example, which is this, this equation. 
So, if we have a localized source, we solved the problem at the very early beginning, and we said we have a slab, and at the center of the slab we have a uh, planar source, inf infinite planar source. Yes? So this is infinite system, so we do not have any boundary condition. When I tell you guys that we are solving infinite system, there is no boundary condition. There is a source condition. And what is the source condition? The source condition is you will put an imaginary imaginary uh, area around your source. And you will shrink this area until you completely attach or completely stick yourself to what? To the source itself. And in this case, the total number of neutrons crossing this unit area, imaginary unit area, will be equivalent to half the source, for example, if you are talking about a slab source, or it will be, if you have a buoyant source, you will have a sphere, a, an imaginary sphere with radius r. Then you said, when the limit of this radius of this sphere shrinks to zero, I will have the number of neutrons crossing the unit area of this sphere equal to the current, of the, of the, or equal to the source term. Yes? So the, the source condition is, I showed to you before the source condition, the source condition for a slab, you will have what? Number of neutrons emitted multiplied by, which is J, multiplied by what? For the slab. When we talk about slab, we talk about number of neutrons emitted per unit area. Yes? So you will have just J, just J. So the limit of j of x when x tends to infinity to uh, zero will give you the source term or have the source term. Okay? When we talk about buoyant source, then when you talk about buoyant source, your solution is or your boundary condition will be will be the following. The buoyant source is here. You will take an imaginary surface around the buoyant. Then you will say my source term will be the total number of neutrons passing through this surface area should be equal when the, when the radius of this sphere shrinks to zero should be the source, the number of neutrons emitted by the source. What's the area, surface area of a sphere? Four pi r square multiplied by J, which is the current that penetrates through this surface area. When you take the limit for r equal to zero, this should be what? your source term. Okay guys, we did something similar to this, which is for the infinite, infinite line. And this is an infinite line here. So the source term will be multiplying the, the what? The current multiplied by the area. And what's the area of the uh, cylinder here? The area, and area of this cylinder is two by r, which is the circumference multiplied by a unit length in the z direction. So unit length is one. So one multiplied by two by r is the area multiplied by j. So this will give you the total number of neutrons bare unit length. Yes? And the source term in case of a, of a line is, is given by what? Bare unit length. So the source term in case of a, sl a slab is given by what? by unit area, because the slab has area. When we are talking about a source which is, is, is line, the source will emit per unit length. There is no area for the line. When we have a buoyant source, the buoyant source will emit per unit, per unit nothing. It will just emit per unit second, because there is no area for the buoyant source. So this is why in the slab I use, I use the current itself. In the line I use the current multiplied by two by uh, two by what? R, and then for the for the buoyant source, I will multiply by four by R square. Did you did you know the difference? So that nobody will be confused. So let me let me show it to you again, so that you will not be confused. Here is the three different situation. When you have a slab, and the slab is in the middle of what? Middle of a medium like this, minus A and plus A x equal to zero, this is a plan, planar, planar source in finite slab, this is a line source, infinite line source in a cylindrical 
in infinite medium you will use cylindrical geometry and this is a point source so for the point source you use 4 by r square multiplied by j and you take the limit when r equal to 0 this will give you the source term for the line source you will use what the limit for 2 by r multiplied by j equal when when r goes to 0 equal to what the source term and here you will take the limit of what the limit of j only without multiplying j by any by anything because you cannot in infinite in an infinite slab you cannot define anything but a unit area which is one by one one centimeter by one centimeter again when you pick up when you try to solve the diffusion equation in infinite medium try to pick up the geometry that's relevant to the the source that you put in the center of the slab of the uh, problem so if, if we say we have an infinite slab so you have only one dimension so it's it's better to use what the Cartesian coordinate when we are talking about about a line what's the symmetry around the line cylindrical, cylindrical symmetry so it's better to use what cylinder when we're talking about point what's the so it's a spherical geometry so this will give you what we use okay guys then we try to solve a couple of couple of problems and again we solve it the we moved from the infinite system to the finite what to the finite system infinite system we have only what source term the source condition yes for a finite system now we have what we have boundary conditions yes so what were our boundary condition for the infinite system flux is zero at infinity our boundary is at infinity and flux is zero at infinity for a finite system we have still the boundary condition but it's no longer equal to what zero so as a first guess if you want to to solve those problems if, if we have a symmetric if we have a symmetric case like this okay guys you have a symmetric slab like this and you don't have any sources coming from the sides and your center is at x equal to zero it's better to solve this in terms of the cinch and the hyper hyper geometric or uh, hyperbolic functions okay guys the sine hyperbolic and the cosine hyperbolic okay and do not do not say that this is a minus a tilde minus x over blah 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 because you will confuse yourself just say that this is sine hyperbolic of x plus c c2 multiplied by cosine hyperbolic of x c1 and and c2 multiplied by sine and cosine then you apply the boundary condition and the first boundary condition will be what the flux at plus or minus a tilde equal to zero once you solve this then you will try to get the current by differentiating the flux and multiplying this by d negative d and then you will use what if you have a source in the middle for example you will use the source the source term or source condition to get the other one of the other constants so when you when you have two two boundaries and you have a in the center you have the your source in the center you will say okay in in slint, in, in slab geometry i will assume that it is c1 sin, sine hyperbolic x plus c2 cosine hyperbolic of x then you will say okay flux at a equal to zero or flux at negative a equal to zero you agree from there you will say zero equal to c sine a plus c2 cosine a then you can get one of those two constants in terms of the other so you will say c1 equal to c2 cosine over sine which will give you the cotangent hyperbolic cotangent or c2 equal to the hyperbolic tangent multiplied by c1 then you will go back in the flux and substitute one of those c's you will have only how many c's left unknown one so instead of having two c's unknown you are left with only one one c then you take this and you need another equation to calculate the other c what is the other equation the flux not, not the flux the current the current source term so you will say that the limit for j when 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 r goes to zero or when x goes to zero 
equal to the source term. So you will get the, the equation, take the limit, see the equation, set the equation goes to the source, and in this case you will be able to figure out what C in terms of what? The source and the current when when the when the when x goes to zero for example. So now you, you got your two two con, two uh, unknowns, the C one and C two. So you return back and plug those two unknowns in the flux equation and that's it. So we solve with this if you see last time and here is the source condition that we got limit for current equal to source over half you get the other the other boundary condition and you get the value for A we have A and B so let me show it to you in details here we have A and C we got the flux at the accelerated distance equal to what? zero we got C in terms of what? C in terms of A we got C back here so we will have A in this side and A in this side the flux will have will be only a function of what? one only one constant then once the flux is a function of one constant we will do the source what? The source condition then from the source condition we will be able to get what? the value of the other constant we will go back in the flux and substitute with A equal to this term and we got some complicated formula for, for, for what? for the flux and again we are solving for half half of the uh, slab then we will say by symmetry the other half will give us exactly the same but negative sign in the exponent so we can use instead of just using the x we can use the amplitude of what x or the absolute value of x and that's it it's very easy okay guys so it's up to you here for example I did not use the sine and cosine I use what exponential because it might be a little bit easier to work with exponential when you add and subtract and divide and stuff like this but since and cosh will be a little bit a little bit difficult yes uh, Muhammad it does not matter but I think it is easier not to confuse yourself to, to solve it to solve first, first the the uh, boundary condition then go to the inner the inner condition which is the source it does not make any difference but I find it very easy to just substitute with x equal to a and get the value of c1 as a, as a function of c2 instead of just differentiating if it's a complex function I will be differentiating like e to the power of uh, e to the power of r over over l over r so you have to def you have to differentiate now a quotient of two functions so it will give you a headache just and if it is addition of two terms it will give you a headache just get rid of one of the constant first so that you will have it as a constant, one constant multiplied by something then differentiate this thing so this is my advice it's up to you of course what do you want to use so for a point source we will use what? A spherical and again the same nabla square phi minus 1 over, a squal, uh, over L square multiplied by phi equal to 0 and again for this, uh, for this equation uh, we did the transformation that uh, the equation is a little bit difficult to to solve yes so we did the transformation that we will we will multiply the flux by set by the function of position by position r and then we will call it omega and then this will give us a new function we can transform this new function to a simple function that we can solve because if you look at the original function here and you write it here this is the original this is the original function here so this is what this is a second order differential equation with with what variable or constant coefficient nope with variable coefficient because I have what I have r so you have to solve this uh, uh, with with what how to solve a differential equation with variable coefficient no, you have to solve it using the one of the method is is the um, uh, Bauer series solution because we do not have if you study the ME 760 we do not for the for the variable coefficient case if the equation is not simple we cannot have a a definite method to solve for the differential equation so we have to solve it by let's say Frobenius or, or the Bauer, Bauer series expansion and so on 
So what we did is by this transformation making omega equal to R phi, we transformed our equation from a, a second order differential equation with variable coefficient to a second order differential equation with constant coefficient. So for a second order differential equation with constant coefficient, it's very easy. The homogeneous solution is just a mix of exponential. Yes, guys? So this is very easy. But for this one, you cannot say that the solution will be a mix of exponential. We figure out that the solution at the end is exponential divided by what? R. Divided by R. Okay, guys? So do not make it difficult on yourself. Try, do not try to solve if you have a differential equation with variable coefficient, especially in those courses, the only way is you either go to the series solution and try to solve it, or you will try some transformation for the flux that will transform your equation from a second order differential equation with variable coefficient to a second order differential equation with what? With constant coefficient. And in this case, you will make it easy and your life will be easier, you will have two exponential function, then when you will substitute with omega equal to r phi, you will divide by what? You will divide by r, and then you will get this here. So this is the solution for the second order differential equation with variable coefficient. And as you see here, it's not pure exponential. It's e to the power of minus r over l divided by r, and e to the power of r over l divided by r. Okay, guys, so do not, if you see as advice for you guys, you knew what's the, the future, uh, what's the differential equation was constant. How many of you know what's the difference between differential equation was constant coefficient and differential equation was variable coefficient? Okay, let me write it here, Mike, if you just uh, focus here. The general formula for the f differential equation was constant coefficient is dn by dx to the power of n y multiplied by a n plus a n minus 1 d n minus 1 by d x n minus 1 y n y plus a n minus 2 d n minus 2 by d x n minus 2 y plus up to a naught multiplied by uh, whatever here equal to uh, q of x. So this is this is uh, uh, n n order n order differential ODE ordinary differential equation ordinary because it does not have any independent variable except one. If it has more than one independent solution, it will be partial differential equation, and it is linear because the highest derivative here, which is dn by dx to the power of n, has an exponent of 1. The power of this highest order is 1. So if the highest order is raised to the power of 2, this is a nonlinear equation. If you have y multiplied by dn y by dx to the power of n, so this is nonlinear differential equation. It is difficult to solve the nonlinear differential equation. And it is uh, linear, and it is with with constant coefficient. Why constant coefficient? Because because all a's all a's which is all r n are constant. So they are not they are not functions they are not functions of the uh, independent variable which is x. And this is uh, we call it inhomogeneous. Inhomogeneous. Why inhomogeneous? Because it does not equal to zero, it equal to some function q of x. This function could be any function, could be a linear function, a linear function, I do not care. As long as this function is is linear or nonlinear, the equation is still linear differential equation. Okay guys, the 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 inhomogeneous nth order ordinary differential equation with variable coefficient with variable with variable coefficient you will remove an and you will put p of x 
or let's say P1, Bn of x multiplied by Dn by Dx to the power of n, y plus Pn minus 1 of x, Dn minus 1 by Dxn, y until, until B0 of x equal to Q of x. So the only difference, the only difference between the differential equation with constant coefficient and the differential equation with variable coefficient is the coefficients of the derivatives and also the coefficients of the function y, for example, um, the co coefficients of the variable y, all of them, they are function of the independent variable, which is x in this case. If any of those has y on it, this is nonlinear differential equation. Any of the, variab the variables here, including y, this is nonlinear and it's very difficult to solve. So what we did in, in, in the problem that I showed you in hand is transforming, transforming a diffusion diff equation. We have here what? R, and R is R, is the independent variable. So we have, this is a differential equation, even we have it only in one term. We have R here, we do not have R here, we do not have R here. Even it shows up in one term, it is none. It's a differential equation, second order differential equation with variable coefficient. So how to transform it to a dif differential equation with, with constant coefficient is by this transformation of the dependent variable phi, which is here y. So we can say y will be equal to um, uh, r multiplied by y equal to z. Then we will transform. So one of the method of solving the differential equation with, with, const, with variable coefficient is to try to change a variable to see if you can transform it from a differential equation with variable coefficient to a differential equation with constant coefficient. Okay, guys, and this is the trick. Otherwise, we can look at, like, the case for the... Um, uh, this is the case for what? For a sphere. If we look at the case for the cylinder, we will notice that the case for the cylinder is a little bit... Um, direct. Why? Why it is direct? Because if you look at this c cylinder, when you when you expand the diffusion equation in cylinder geometry, in cylindrical geometry, you will obtain a second order differential equation with with what? With variable coefficient. But it is the Bessel function. So I knew that the solution because I know that this form is the Bessel form. So how to solve the Bessel, uh, Bessel equation? If you take the M, uh, ME 760, those guys who are talking the ME 760 with us, they knew that the solution for the Bessel function comes from the series expansion for the for the, uh, the, uh, the the dependent variable. So why here you will say y equal to summation from n equals zero to infinity, a n x to the power of n, or you will use the Frobenius method if there is if there is a singularity in, in your problem and you want to solve around around the uh, regular singular point. I do not know if you take the classes for, for uh, differential equation or not. Okay, guys. Then we moved on after solving the infinite case and we solved the finite case. Now we moved on and say, okay, we solve it only for a slab or for a line source or for a point source. Can we solve if there is a, a distribution of sources inside the medium? And here it came to the kernel or the Green's function. So we'll say, um, I knew what, what is the flux at a point x prime because of a source present at x. Yes, and this is the kernel. And we say, if you want to get the flux, for example, distribution, all what you will do is just integrate over this kernel. And the kernel is the value of the flux based on a very sharp source, whether it is point, whether it is line, whether it is a slab. So this is the flux of a uh, neutrons based on a source present at x equal to zero. This is what we solve. What if the source is not equal at, uh, is not positioned at x equal to zero? Let's, let's say that the source was positioned at x equal to x prime. And we want to calculate the flux at x. So this is what we call the kernel. And then if you sum all the kernels or integrate over all the kernels, you will be able to get the flux where? The flux in this medium. Then we moved on and we said, okay, now we want to solve the diffusion equation with a source. When we moved on and tried to solve the diffusion equation with a source, we, 
before before moving on and solving the diffusion equation with a with a source, we said that okay, let's examine the solution of the diffusion equation time dependent diffusion equation first. And this is what we did last time in a slab geometry like this. Here is the diffusion equation, and it is the time dependent. Here is the extraneous source, here is the fission source, the leakage term, this is the absorption, and we got the boundary condition again, flux at accelerated, extrapolated distance equal to zero, and we have uh, the flux at uh, time r, r and any, any r and time zero equal to phi naught, and then we said, okay, how we will solve this problem? We have now uh, a solution for the diffusion equation, but Previously, we assumed that the time rate of change is equal to what? Zero. Although we have only one dimension and we solve in a slab, it was very easy. A differential equation, ordinary differential equation with a constant coefficient, solve it, you get exponentials, that's it. But when you include the time, it's no longer, uh, you are no longer solving at the ordinary differential equation. You are solving what? are solving partial differential equation because you have two two independent variables you have the time and you have the what the position. so one of the methods standard methods of solving partial differential equation is to represent the function that you are solving the the dependent function as a two separate two separate functions of the of each of the independent variables so let's assume that i am solving the differential equation, the diffusion equation, d by dt, equal to this, and I am solving this in spherical geometry. Or, um, yeah, spherical geometry. But I do not have symmetry. What does it mean I do not have symmetry? That the flux around the phi angle is different. I have n not non-isotropic source, any isotropic source. So the source of a scattering of the neutron is not isotropic, let's say. Of, of course, this will violate the diffusion equation. But let's say I have, I have, I put, I put in, inside the, the medium, non-isotropic medium. So in this case, I cannot neglect theta, I cannot neglect phi. So how many variables now I will have? I will have r, I will have theta, I will have what? Phi, and I will have what? Time. So in this case, you have to say the, the flux, will be just capital theta of theta, a function just of theta, and capital phi of phi, as, as uh, another function of, uh, of phi, and capital R of small r, uh, you, will, you will write it like this. You will write it like uh, the flux will be just capital theta of the, uh, of the, of the uh, uh, dimension theta multiplied by capital phi of the dimension phi multiplied by capital R of the dimension R multiplied by capital time of the dimension time. So you have one, two, three, four of those equations and you will be able to separate four different equations that you will solve independently and then you will get each one of them then you multiply the four equations by, by each other to get the solution. And this is what we did here. So what we did is just assuming that the flux is a function of r and function of what? Time, and then solving the equation, when we substitute in the equation, we were able to say that those are the summation of two equations, each one of them equal to a constant. So we reach it to two separate equations, one for time and the other one for what? For position. We solve the equation for time, we notice that it's exponential function of what? Time, we solve the other, equation for position and we notice that the equation of position is just what sine and cosine and this is how we merge it both solution and we get to the final solution that we get to the final solution that that the flux the flux is just some eigenvalues expansion of eigenvalues which are the sine and cosine functions okay guys then we said, okay, when we, when we reach to this case, we learn it from this solution of the diffusion equation, the time, time independent diffusion equation. We learn it that the flux as a function of time has an exponential what? Exponential decay or exponential growth, it depends. And the flux as a function of position has symmetry. If you solve in a slab, you will have what? 
sine and cosine. Yes? So we said, okay, instead of just solving the diffusion equation every time like this, we reach it to the criticality condition. And from there, we reach to criticality condition, and we notice that our criticality condition was just given by this formula. K effective equal to new sigma fission over uh, sigma absorption divided by 1 plus L square B square G. What's this term? K infinity. So this term is what? It's K infinity. So K effective equal to K infinity divided by 1 plus L square B square J. What is 1 over L 1 plus L square B square? The leakage. So the effective multiplication factor is just the infinite multiplication factor divided by the leakage. So we reach to a very handy formula. When we solve the, the, the uh, diffusion equation with a source, when we solve it this with time, we notice that we have what? We have two components. We knew that there is an exponential increase or decay multiplied by some function in what? In position, in, in, in position, symmetric in position. Then we move on and we said, what is the criticality condition? What does it mean criticality? T by dt equal to what? Zero. So we reach it to a situation that, oh, criticality means this condition. So from now on, instead of just solving the diffusion equation and getting the criticality condition by just setting the d by dt equal to zero and getting everything, no, we will just solve this what? This equation. So all what you will do is to figure out what's the value for what? Bg. So what you will do is you solve the diffusion equation, the the what, the steady state diffusion equation in slab in what, in a cylinder in sphere. sphere and in parallel pipe, and get Bg what Bg is. And we spend a couple of lectures figuring out what is the buckling in a slab. What's the buckling in a slab? Pi over a all square. What's the buckling in a, a cylinder? Two component. One in the R and one in the the one in the Z direction is still the same by over H, yes, and the buckling in the in the new over R, yes, and so on, yeah, all square and so on. So I I will continue next time. Do you want to continue reviewing the material next time, or do you want to start something else uh, like the? I, we have two more lectures. Uh, I think. One, one lecture will be enough for the types of nuclear reactors, and we, we still ca we can one more lecture for review. Do you want to make review, or do you want to make the uh, the uh, two lectures as the uh, types of nuclear reactor? It's up to you guys. Review. Review is fine. Okay. Okay. We'll see you next time.